How's everybody doing this morning? Good. All right. I love it. I love it. Let's get right into Philippians chapter 4. This will be the conclusion. Tell your neighbor the conclusion. You got to say it like that. The conclusion. We have been in Philippians since March. And then the uh, pandemic hit, and then we did a bunch of other stuff, and then we got back into Philippians. Um, I hope it's been helpful. If you have chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, I will read. So then, my dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, my joy and crown in this manner, stand firm in the Lord, dear friends, I urge Erodia, and I urge Cynthia to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is is any more excellence, and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Father, thank you so much for this wonderful day that you have blessed us with. Now, Lord, as we engage with your word, can you speak to us? Lord, can we lay down any defensive mechanism that would cause us not to listen to your spirit? Father, I do not wish to be hidden, but I pray that you will penetrate and break my heart, that I may hear from you, that I may see things that I, that I keep uh, erecting and, and using um, to push across my agenda, especially when it comes to others. Father, I want to be vulnerable to you. I don't want to go with my thoughts. I want the mind of Christ to be my defense, to be my, to be my directive, to be my agenda, and to be everything that I do. Help me, Lord. Help me see the areas that I may have created that keeps me from doing the things you tell me to do and being the person you've called me to be. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, which is rich and is applicable to where I am today, where your church is today in 2020, in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of the world still being out of focus and out of whack. Lord, can you help us that we may be used for your glory, that our speech may be flavored with your love, that our actions will be uh, honest and filled with grace, and then our eyes will see people through the lens of mercy. That we will not be arrogant because we think we know everything, but we will be, well, please help us be surrendered to your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Uh, almost 19 years ago, I remember the day I used to work for the electric company and uh, I read meters. And so I would walk around all day reading people's electric and gas meters. It was a I got paid okay, but it was really a challenging job because we had to work in the rain, we had to work uh, when it was cold, uh, we had to work in some, some real challenging communities, that's probably the nicest way I could say it, or I've been chased by dogs, I've had the police called on me, I've had a lot of um, challenges with doing my job. And I remember one day in September getting up and dropping Kyrie off to 
childcare. Uh, Charlie was about two, three months old, and I went to Dunkin' Donuts and I got my coffee, and then I hit my ground to read the meters in the community where I was called to read the meters. And I was, as I was walking through, there was a guy painting a house, and on the radio, the news was on, and the news broadcaster said, hey, uh, there's an airplane, a guy must have gotten lost or something, and it crashed into a building in New York. And, and I was like, man, that's crazy. Like, how do you do that and hit a building? But Okay, and so I continued walking and reading meters, and I remember walking through the projects, and I was reading the meters there, waving at people. And then, it, back in the day, they used to put gas meters in people's basements, and so I would have to go into a lot of homes to, in their basement to read the meter. And I got to this one home to read the meter, and there was a plumber there, there was a painter there, um, there was um, someone else who was doing something else. There was like five guys in the house doing different things. And so I show up to go in the house, to read the meter, and they're talking a little bit about what was happening in New York. And so one of them turns the TV on to see that uh, one of the buildings was on fire, and it was a crazy scene in New York City. I was like, whoa, this is insane. And about two minutes in, we were all sitting on the couch in, these str in that stranger's home watching TV. It was, the cr it was insane. It was like, none of us live here, none of us belong here, and we're all sitting around like we, we go way back, and none of us went way back. And as we were watching the news, I remember thinking about my family, thinking about the world, like how is this happening? And then there's news of another plane that went down, and then one hit the Pentagon, and everything in my worldview was really shooken. One, because I assumed, I don't know where I got this from, I just kind of grew up thinking that like America was like, it was impossible to penetrate our defenses. Like, like there was just something in my mind, like there's no way you can attack the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., right? There's these missiles underground that will come up and will fire at anything coming against us. And that day I was like, what? Like some dude just took over an airplane and flew into a building and flew into the Pentagon, like the Pentagon, like, like the place where all the plans happen, like where all the government secrets and everything is taking place. Some dude just took an airplane from New York, flew it down to DC, and just flew right into that building. Yeah. And I just remember all of us sitting in the room, having all, like, all these things flooding and rushing. Like, like, do I go get Kyrie from school? Do I go home to be with my wife and our newborn? Like, what exactly am I supposed to do? And sitting in this room, it's me, Ed, Tom, and Frank. And we're all sitting here having this conversation. Now, in New Jersey, there's this thing called unions. I don't know if they have a lot of them here, Mel, but in New Jersey, there's unions everywhere. And unions are like baby gangs. They don't really get along with anyone who's not inside of the union. But you have all these different union guys sitting in the room. None of us is talking about, you know, I'm union 4789, and we don't like union 8273. In that moment, we were all together going through the same thing. And in the weeks to come, like it, it's like Democrats and Republicans and liberals and, and conservatives and everyone was just holding hands, singing. Uh, church that Sunday, the attendance in churches around the country went crazy and through the roof because everyone was kind of rocked at the same time. And it was like this horrible moment brought so many people together. And this is where Paul is kind of giving this story here with these two people. He has marched through chapter one, talking about his situation, his challenges, and how it has actually furthered and advanced the gospel. That there are people who are in prison here with me who are believers, who are a little discouraged because they were going through something, but once they saw that I'm in here and that the Lord is still moving, they were encouraged. And so he's writing back to the church, the church he planted in Acts 16. This is a church that he loved. These are people he did ministry with, and he's writing this letter back to them. As we're concluding this, this is like, this is the point of all of this that he's pointing to, because you got to think through the context. All of these people are reading through this letter together. They're gathered just like we are as someone, Epaphroditus, or someone comes back, and they're reading through Philippians, and they're all hearing it. And they're hearing Paul say this, hey, I know you're in a tough situation. I know it's hard. But God is still moving. Then chapter 2, right? Chapter 2, he gives the example of this is the mindset you should have, church. Have the mindset that was in Christ Jesus, who is high, lifted up, but came low for the benefit of all. Be in unity. Be of one mind. Remember to have joy. Like he's continuously, 16 times, remember to have joy because Christian people sometimes forget to have joy. And he's given this argument, and he's, he's, he's like yelling through this letter, hey, remember to have joy. 
in the midst of a challenging situation. I'm in jail writing this to you. I got to tell you free people to be filled with joy. I got to tell you Christian people to be together in unity. Be in unity. Be together. That's your brother. That's your sister. Then he gives the example of Timothy and Epaphroditus, right? Timothy was his son in the ministry that he developed. Um, He was discipled by his mother and his grandmother, and then he came under Paul, and Paul is training him for ministry so that he can go and be a preacher and help the churches. He can go out and advance the gospel, and he uses him and his sacrifice as an example. Then Epaphroditus is one of the members of their church, which is so awesome. He's a person that they did ministry with that they knew, and he's saying, look at this dude who almost died, and God kept him. He sacrificed for me, and he sacrificed for you, and I'm sitting Sending him back to you with this letter. And then Paul gets to chapter 4. Last week we were concluding, as, and I, the point I was sharing is that we have Jesus. Uh, he has us, but there is still in Paul this striving towards knowing him and having him more. That, that he took all that he knew and all the advantages and all the privilege and all the education, all that stuff. And he's like, that is nothing. I just want more of Jesus. And then all of this. All of this is pointing to chapter 4, where he exposes something to us that we didn't see earlier. He doesn't make mention of it, but he's talking about joy. He's talking about church people getting along. He's talking about, you know, keep it together, be excited, sacrifice for other people. Then he gets to 4. Can you imagine sitting there in the audience in Philippi and his awesome letters coming, and then you, you hear your name, right? Epaphroditus snitched. He told Paul what was happening back in Philippi. There was two ladies in the church that had beef. They weren't getting along. They loved Jesus. They were part of the leadership of the church. They were members there, but they had a problem with each other. And verse 4 gives up the goods. Look at them. I urge Herodia and I urge Syntyche to agree in the Lord. That's it. He doesn't say what they did. He doesn't say why they weren't getting along. He doesn't say who was right or who was wrong. And I'm pretty sure Epaphroditus probably had his view on it, right? He's like, man, Paul, I can't believe this one did this and this one did that. He, he, Paul doesn't say any of that stuff. But you can now start to realize, looking back at all the other chapters, that Paul was pointing to this moment. My first point this morning is this. Paul could have said, hey, church people, get along. But he didn't. He directly called their names out. Direct, he he didn't beat around the bush. He's like, I hear that there's, he didn't go, I hear there's some women at the church that ain't getting along. He called out their names that is etched in the scriptures forever. It was direct. It's one thing that we've, we've lost a little bit of is the sense of being direct for the right reason, right? Like sometimes we're direct because we want to be mean, and we want to expose people. But what Paul is doing here is he, he didn't do this to be ugly or to be nasty. He did this because it was right for the church. That we could allow drama and mess to continue and to go on. But Paul was like, no, 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 no. That's, that's not how, like that phoniness, that fake Christianese stuff and all that other stuff, that is not acceptable in the household of God. I understand doing that if you work for Google and if you work for Amazon and you got to keep the culture and all these other things. But in the household of faith, we are truth people. Therefore, if you say something ugly on Facebook and you are a believer and you belong to this household of faith, that you should be called to the carpet because of that. And we shouldn't have to dance around it. That phoniness and that veneer that we put up is the thing that disgusts the world because Christians are just as phony and fake as other people. And Paul says, no, you two, stop. Can you imagine being there in the audience, knowing you had this beef, sitting there feeling justified, and all of a sudden the letter's being read? It's like, y'all got to love people. You ever hear something that someone's saying, like, man, I wish they were here to hear this? It's like, dang it. I wish that idiot could hear this today because the preacher is preaching to them. And then your name comes up. Oh, but, 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 but you don't know about them, but you, yeah, 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 what about you? Why do you feel as though you're so exempt from this? Look at Paul. Hey, guys, you two. Calls him by name directly. He's not beating around the bush. Part of the reason why he's not beating around the bush because the church is the 
organization. It, it is the team. It is the family that reveals God to the world. Like, like, like we're, we're, we're not some, we're the Girl Scouts. You know what I mean? We're, we're not them over there. Like, like we, we can't afford to get it wrong because we are, are the institution and the people where, God get, where people get to see God. That is a heavy responsibility. But I can't afford to get stirred up in my feelings and my emotions because people can miss God. This is why we have to handle this carefully because this is where people get to hear God. How can you hear God if you're worried about this person over here that doesn't like you? Like, you have enough of that in the world. Right? You have to go to work with people who really don't like you, and they front, and they have this veneer, you got to get called down to HR, and everyone says, yes, we're going to get along, and all that other phony stuff. But in the household of faith, it's unacceptable. People get crushed. They get bruised. And the thing that always bothers me when there's tension in church is that for those who really don't know the God of the universe, they assume that's him. And if they get mad at him and walk away from the church because of people who should all surrender and be subject to his word. Don't spend your walk dancing around things when there's an issue. We need to practice it. Maybe you were raised in a family where we just didn't talk about problems and we just ignored things and we, we swept it under the rug. That's cool. I get it. I'm sorry to hear that, but that is not the way we do this, right? We do this differently. We don't look like the world. Not everything that we learned in our families was right. Paul here is saying, listen, in this new family, we deal with problems. Now, every problem doesn't mean it has to be broadcast and someone has to call it out on Sunday morning. Like, you took my parking spot in the parking lot. Like, you could have resolved that in the parking lot, right? If you surrendered to each other and you're like, hey, sit, girl, I saw you were coming in. I don't know. Something, I was just being stupid. Like, you could deal with that. But then there are some problems that need to be brought to a higher level. Amen? Yeah. It will eat you up. You will miss God. You will miss what he's saying to you. It will always be about them. That's part of the problem in our culture today. It's, it's always them. It's, it's them, them, them. It's, it's, it's always a them, and it's never, Lord, how, where, where am I in this mess? And part of it is we feel like they'll get away with it. And Paul's like, no, it's, that's, not, that's not what we do. And here's the second point. We need mediators. Look what Paul says. If you read real fast, you'll miss it. He says, yes. I also ask you, true partner, to help these women. Like, 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 Paul is imploring. He doesn't say the person's name, but as the letter is being read, he goes, my true partner. Basically, there was someone there in the church that Paul was saying, hey, can you, can you help solve this problem? Two things, which means, one, he wasn't already or she wasn't already doing it. They saw the problem. They felt the problem. They knew what was going on. So Paul has to go, hey, hey, my friend, can, can you mediate this? Because this is getting out of control. It's impacting the church. It's affecting the people. Can you please get in before it continues on? And, they, and other people think this is the way Christianity should be. Right. Oh. Paul isn't a stranger to beef in the body. If we go back to Acts, Paul goes out on the first missionary journey. He's with the homie Barnabas. Barnabas is the encourager. He's the guy. He co-signs for other people. He's a good dude. He co-signs and, and brings people in. Everyone loves Barnabas. He's a rock star in the church. They go out on the missionary journey, and Barnabas' cousin, John Mark, bounced on him in the midst of whatever was going on. Like, they were out there, they were doing their thing. Can you imagine we go out on a mission trip, right? And we're all sharing the gospel, you know, we're serving, we're watching each other's back because it's a crazy space. And then we look over and our homie leaves. It's like, man, this is crazy, or this is too much. I left something on the stove, I gotta go. And Paul isn't Barnabas. Paul is like, 
extra. He's a little edgy. He's like, nah, we, we, we got to get in people's faces. Paul gets stoned and he almost dies and he's so stubborn. He gets back up and doesn't go, well, I guess the Lord wants me to go somewhere else. He goes back to the town and preaches like Paul is that ridiculous. And Barnabas is like, he's the encourager, right? He's like, hey, I know it's challenging. So they get ready to go back out on another missionary journey. And Barnabas wants to bring John Mark, his cousin, right? That's his wiring. He is wired to encourage, to strengthen, to bring people along. That ain't Paul's wiring. Paul's wiring is like, peace to that dude. He left us when we were out there. I can't rock with him. I don't trust him. He might abandon us again. And Barnabas is like, hey, brother, haven't we all fallen short? Haven't we all sometimes wanted to run away? I don't know why I sound like Joel, uh, but, <laughs> but it does fit. That's, how, that's probably how Barnabas' attitude was. Like, come on. Give him a chance. And Paul's like, I'm not giving him a chance. He betrayed Jesus. Like, can you hear that in Paul? But this is Paul now writing this letter later, realizing that he misstepped. And later on, we see where Paul sins for John Mark. They fixed their relationship. But Paul has learned something between Acts 13 and the Philippians 4, that it is better to reconcile, to address problems, to build and encourage your brother. And, and here, this is... This is the thing, this is part of the reason why we have problems, especially if you grew up in a church, right? We, we've been trained and we've been taught if we do things and handle things the right way, we'll have a happy ending, right? It's like, if you, if you just be honest, if you tell the truth, if you do this, everything will work out. Well, that's not true. It isn't always true. Sometimes you do the right thing and you get fired. You do the right thing and people lie on you. Like, like the, there's only one way to avoid conflict, tension, and trouble. And that is to never have relationships with people and to stay, do like Thanos at the end of the, the movie where he becomes a hobbit on a planet by himself. That is the only way you avoid conflict, is to stay away from people. You will never do anything for the Lord where there will be no conflict. You, you, you will, if, if you're married in this room, like you could do everything right and still have problems. You're bringing two completely different people together. The church is a bunch of weird people with views and ideas and thoughts. Some of the, sometimes we mix it up with scripture and our emotions and pizza and what we learn from this pastor over here or this thing over here, and we bring it together and go, I can't believe these idiots. And God says, yeah, this is my family. These are my peoples, right? You think this way, but, but, but if we continue to surrender to Jesus. But, but here's, here's the catch. They have the word, right? Paul's giving them three chapters of directions of what to do. And he says, yeah, you still need a mediator, a person. Because sometimes you will read this and assume with your worldview and your thoughts and your emotions, and that just can't be right, and get it wrong. You, 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 you can clearly sit down and look at the Greek and then go through the Hebrew and then study all these commentaries and still land in the wrong space. And Paul says, my brother, my sister, can, can you sit down with those two? Because they, they have the word, but they need some help. They, they need someone who is balanced, someone who, who can mediate and look at the situation properly and appropriately, who doesn't have all the emotional attachments that they have and be able to speak to both of them. Oh, man. Wow. Mel said last week that he's a consultant, right? You know what a consultant does? I mean, he made a joke out of his own job. He, like, like a consultant just comes in and gets a bunch of money for telling people what to do. But one of the clear, beautiful parts of being a consultant is that someone from somewhere else who isn't attached to the problems, isn't attached to the people that can come in from the outside and clearly see everything that's happening better than everyone on the inside. I mean, that's the gospel, right? Like, like Jesus, someone from somewhere else comes in and infiltrates where we are and says, you are all wrong, all of you. All, all, you over there, whoo, wrong. You, nah. And this is what Paul's arguing in the last chapter. He's saying, I did everything and I said everything and I achieved everything I was supposed to achieve and I ended up on the opposite side of the gospel. Like, we should all have that level of humility that we could still be wrong. And so Paul says, hey, could you mediate this problem 
could, could you sit down with them? I know they're, they're building up teams on both sides and, 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 and they're tweeting out things because they really want to hit this person and they want them to read it and then they're fighting this battle with someone they don't see. Can, 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 you, can you come in between here and show them how that is destructive and it isn't building up anyone? 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6. For there is one God, one mediator, also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. We we need to implore outside people. And and here's the other part, right? We need to trust them, put, put our weapons down, and give them the freedom and the liberty to tell us we're wrong. What are we afraid of? Why, why, do, why do we keep our ammunition? Why do we keep our things? Because, and we always want to fight because there's this, this thing inside of us that's always like this. Ooh, if they, say, if they do that, and, and Jesus is saying, well, but, but I thought you'd surrendered. Like, this is an everyday surrendering, right? It's, it's like if, if you're always waiting for that text or that thing, or if they say this to me when I get there, I'm going to drop them, dog. I'm telling you if they do it. Like, like this takes an everyday dying. This is a practice. This, this, is, this is like asking one more time, did I say, did, was my, the way I said it wrong? And if, that, and if you've given that person the freedom to be honest with you, then there's, they won't be fearful to go, well, I'm going to side with you because you're going to get mad at me also. Because sometimes you could be angry and, and you can be a little bit edgy and off, but if, but if you have a mature mediator in your life, they're like, look, I, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't want to bruise you, but I love you too much to protect myself. We have real reasons, real reasons. Like there's real conflict. We have real reasons to have problems and to argue. Like, like I am not belittling the issues that we have in the world today, that they are real issues for conflict. But this isn't written to the rest of the world. This is written to people who say, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is King, I am following him, I'm following his direction, I am not trying to score points with these people or to look good here, I am completely surrendered to Jesus. And that is hard. And that's why the last point I have is to come to agreement in the Lord. Look what Paul says to them. I urge Erodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Like one of them could have truly been at fault. Paul's not going there for the issue. He's actually appealing to a higher thing. That if I'm saying that Jesus is the Lord of my life, and you're saying Jesus is the Lord of your life, then there cannot, how is it possible that we can at least come to a place where we love and respect each other? And Paul is saying to agree in the Lord. I don't agree with your corny football team, and I don't agree with your view on this. I don't agree with this over here, but I will say this, that we are brothers and sisters because we tr- there is a Lord over our lives that we are submitted to. And Paul is saying, I know you love Jesus because we served together. We did ministry together. We shared the gospel together. When Paul went in Acts 16, he found a group of women who were women who feared God. And this is the group of people who he planted the church with. These women were on fire for the Lord. He preached the gospel. The church starts. These two women were probably a part of that original team. They were doing ministry. They were witnessing the people. Paul is saying, listen, I know you love, I, I know he's, like your, your focus isn't on him right now. I need you two to get back to focusing on him so you can let that stuff go. Let it go. Let it go. Sixth grade, no, seventh grade, I had a friend who sat next to me in school named Paul. He, Paul was smart. He was like, I don't even know if he studied. He just got straight A's. I, as some of you heard this morning, don't always get straight A's. But I collected baseball cards, and Paul collected baseball cards. I was a Phillies fan. I'm from the North. It's a long story short. I like good teams. And I collected, though I only had one player on the team that I liked, uh, Mike Schmidt, 
I didn't care for the rest of the team, but I was a Phillies fan, and so I collected all of their baseball cards. For the Mets, uh, I had Daryl Strawberry, didn't collect all the other guys, threw those away. But for the Phillies, the guy on the bench, I had his card. The guy, the water boy, if he had a card, I would have had his card. I just had all their cards. It was just, these are my team. And one day, Paul asked me, do you have Ron Jones's card? And I'm like, Ron Jones, I don't know. I have all the guys' cards. He goes, well, if you have that card, that it's worth a little bit of money. Uh, I would pay for it. I'm like, how much? He's like, I think it's worth about 18 bucks. I'm in seventh grade. That's a million dollars as far as I'm concerned. You can have Ron Jones's card. I don't even know if he's that good anyway. So I went home and I got the card out. I'm so excited. And my little brother ripped it a little bit. And I was like, oh, I just want to punch you in the head. At least it'll still be worth maybe $8 or something. So I take it to school the next day, and Paul looks at my card, and he's like, nah, I don't want it. So I'm discouraged. I'm down. I get on the bus, and the person who sits next to me on the bus is one of my best friends from my neighborhood, Demetrius. Me and Demetrius are just great friends. We hang out all the time. Uh, you know, Demetrius... Um, it's from the projects. He moved to our neighborhood, so he grew up in a, a rough environment. I grew up in the suburbs. I know some of you think that I'm just thuggish, ruggish bone. It's not true. I grew up in the suburbs, um, visited the hood, didn't live there. I could go back home, had a dog, cat, um, my own bedroom, bump bed. Uh, life was pretty great and never got in a fight before. Didn't have to. I wrestled. I was, I was horrible because I only weighed like 30-something pounds. But I did it anyway. And so one day, we're, we're, I get home. I'm on the bus discouraged because of my baseball card. And then someone tells me when I get home from school that Demetrius stole my baseball card. And I'm furious. I'm angry. I'm already mad because I lost my $18. I'm already mad because it's ripped and my brother ripped it. And now my friend, my good best friend, steals my card. And so I rush down to his house. Give me my baseball card. And he laughs at me. He was from the projects. He wasn't scared of me. But I was, you know, dude, you better give me my baseball card. And he's like, ha. Huh. So then all of our friends come outside. And now we have an audience. Now I'm like, oh, what do I do now? He's got my baseball card. I can't go home without my baseball card. I start crying. He's laughing. This girl that we both likes outside. I'm getting frustrated. I can't take it anymore. And so I punched him in the face. Yeah, I told you I was still a little thuggish, right? <laughs> Hit him. I was like, blah. What, what? I didn't do what, what. I was, I was surprised at myself. I was like, oh my gosh, what did I just do? <laughs> what do I do next? <laughs> right? Because I, I, I have done this before, right? I, I, yeah, look, man, my mom baked cakes and cookies for all of us and made peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Life was pretty good. I didn't have to fight for anything. But I hit him. And Demetrius goes, when I hit him, his head goes back like this. And then he pops back up. And I'm like, oh, crud. <laughs> I at least wish I would have knocked him out. In the movies, you hit someone, they're gone. No. Demetrius looks at me. I look at him. I can hear everyone go, ooh. Start running. <laughs> Problem was, Demetrius was faster than me, and he caught me, and we just started wrestling. And I thought about that, that our friendship and our relationship was broke. I mean, this was my friend. He spent the night at my house. I spent the night at his house. I knew his mom. Like, we were homies. But he violated our relationship. He wouldn't apologize. And so we just wrestled on the ground for like 10 minutes. And then he said, all right, I'm going to give you your card back. So he gave me my card back. And I think I yelled something back, like, you better give it back. We never talked about that ever again. Three days later, we played basketball together. Like, like, there was no fixing of the problem. There was no addressing it. We're 40-some years old. We're still good friends. We have never re went back to that argument, that fight, that foolishness. And he got that girl. <laughs> but I won in the long run. Praise Jesus. <laughs> what did he say? He you, better... you will have conflict. It's inevitable. You, there will be some things you don't like. There will be some people who, Jesus knows, there will be that you will be furious and angry with. And you will be justified a lot. But when I look at the picture that Jesus says, he says, John 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. And that, that, that would be cool if he would have ended it there. But he says, 
even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. It's like, dang it. Why did you have to say the second part? Because I can easily figure out on my own terms what it means to love the person next to me. That's easy. Like, I did this. That's enough. They should be satisfied. And Jesus goes, yeah, in comparison to what you think is right. If you're the Lord of your life, then that's enough. But if I'm going to be the Lord over your life, then I'm the example. Oh, man. That means you got to see yourself even when you think you're right. Or he isn't truly the Lord over your life. 1 Kings, Solomon is now in charge, and there's a story of these two women. Actually, I'm, I'm going to read it real fast, because I, sometimes I assume that everyone is kind of familiar with every Bible story. 1 Kings 3, and I'll read 16. It says that there was these two women who were prostitutes. Like, like the writer here is giving us a picture that these aren't upstanding citizens in society. They're both harlots if you have like an older translation, came to the king and stood before him. One woman said, please, my Lord, this woman and I have the same, live in the same house and I have a baby while she was in the house. On the third day after I gave birth, she also had a baby and we were alone. No one else was with us in the house. Just the two of us were there. So it was just us and our babies. During the night, this woman's son died because she laid on him. She got up in the middle of the night and took my son from my side while your servant was asleep. She laid him in her arms and she put her dead son in my arms. When I got up in the morning to nurse my son, I discovered he was dead. And that morning when I looked closely at him, I realized that this is not the son I gave birth to. No, the other woman said, my son is the living one. Your son is the dead one. The first woman said, no, your son is the dead one. My son is the living one. So they argued before the king. And the king replied, this woman says, this is my son who is alive and your son is dead. But the woman says, no, your son is dead and my son is alive. And the king continued, bring me a sword. So they brought the sword to the king and the king said, cut the living boy in two and give him to the one and half to the other. And the woman whose son was alive spoke to the king because she felt great compassion for her son. My Lord, give her the living baby. And she said, but please don't have him killed. Like in this picture is an amazing display of the wisdom of Solomon, right? Like, he, this dude is crafty and clever. He's like, all right, I got a way to pull out the right one. I got a way to figure out whose baby this is. Let's just cut the baby in half, and, and that will draw out the one. And so the one lady says, "Kill, go ahead, cut him in half. And the other one says, no, give him to her. And it's, look at the, the, the intensity of the sacrifice of the mom whose baby that was. She was like, you know what? I don't like her. I don't like her, but I love this baby. And so I'm, for, for his safety and for his sake, I am willing to let go and sacrifice and allow myself to be hurt and injured and to be tormented and to live with this pain because I prefer this. That is a picture of loving someone else. It, it is the willingness to go, I don't have to win here. I will give up and I will give in and I will let go so that you may live and you may win and, and you may prosper. And this is the picture of loving your enemies and loving this other person and loving them and preferring other people. It is a willingness to absorb things. And, and for some reason, our culture is conditioning us to, to not absorb anything. Like if there's anything I'm learning there is some tension that I have to grow up and learn to live with. There are some problems I can't fix, and I have to live, and I have to function, and I have to be a servant of the king in the midst of those problems, and I'll never get my point across, and people may lie, and I won't always be able to defend myself, and I'll never be able to correct all these people, and to justify myself, I have to live with some of that tension, and I will be called a liar. 
And, I, I will, and people will make me to be the bad guy, and I have to learn how not to fight with the weapons that this world uses. Because in that display of me defending myself, onlookers will look and go, is, is that how the church? It's, is, is that how? Jesus says they will know that you are mine by the love, by what you are willing to go through together with each other and how you fight through that. That means we are honest and we confront things when it needs to be honest because it's hurting the body. That means we get a mediator involved because if we can't solve this together and I can't see your view, you can't see my view, we've lost sight of Jesus. We need to bring a third party person in the midst of this. We are inviting someone to come in and correct us both. Maybe we're both wrong. This is the way we actually do this thing. And here at the Hill Church, that is, that is even wor- it's even harder here, right? If you're looking for a place where you can at least agree with most of the people you go to church with, you should find a place that isn't diverse like ours. You should find a place where everyone's either a soccer mom or everyone like does this or everyone votes this way or they look this way and they go this way and they believe this person or they have this political view. But if you're going to be in a context that's diverse, that very word alone causes conflict and it rises up and raises tension. Diverse, different. Like, like if you find a different cultural context where everyone's kind of on the same place and they listen to the same music and they go in the same direction. That is a lot easier. But this is what the scripture says, that you can actually be in a diverse, tension-filled place. If Jesus is Lord and he is lifted up, then all those secondary things surrender and fall to his feet with our view, with our direction, with our going, with our correction, with, with, with our love for each other, wins the day because people go, y'all ain't got no reason to be together, but y'all love each other. What y'all got? Because I, I, y'all don't even look like you should like each other. That's where the power of the gospel is seen. It's like we do have a reason. It is that Jesus is bigger than my preferences. That is the beauty of him being on full display. This is the disruption he's constantly doing with the Samaritans and raising them up in the arguments that they were considered as negative people. And he's saying, yeah, some of them are going to go into the kingdom before you. What? Yeah, those are your brothers. Those are your sisters. That's the tension. And this is the argument that Paul's finishing Philippians with. Be in unity. Fight for unity. Protect unity. This is why, I mean, I have friends that go to churches, and, and during this last season, um, people are posting stuff on Facebook and saying different things with their opinion, and people are finding out, like, this person that I love and I've been serving in children's ministry with and I thought we were cool hates these things that I love? What? And you know what we do? We go to church. Hey, Sister Sue, how are you doing? I just love you, and everything's great and fine. It's like, no, I am boiling on the inside because I can't believe you think that way. Some things require coffee. Some things require a mediator. But at all costs, we have to protect the unity. Here, I mean, we, we're, we're, we're going to talk about hard things. It's just kind of what we do. We, there's no reason to have a facade. I, I want the power of God to show up. And I want God's presence to live and dwell amongst us. It means we have to deal and address and have long conversations. And and watch this, and at the end, we will probably not agree. The issue that was going on here in this church wasn't a doctrinal issue, but there was something else causing the conflict. There is times where we just have some weird, wacky views, and we realize we just can't do things together. But all the other stuff, especially what was happening here, was just some personal preferences that needed to be dealt with. 2 Corinthians 5.18 All this is from God, who through Christ Jesus reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This is your job, to be at peace, to protect the unity, to be a minister of reconciliation. And so... If there was nothing you got from this today, 
get this. We daily have to submit and surrender to the Lordship of Jesus every day. Every day. And Paul is talking to all of us. The Spirit of God is speaking to us. In two months, the election's coming, and, 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 and everything is going to be crazy, and people are going to be upset, and they're going to be all over the place, and, and you just want to, you want, to, want to yell because your person may not win. And every four years, we play the price is right. That is what our society is built on. You ever see the prices? It's kind of old for some of you younger people. And I, but, but, but there's this wheel where the guy goes up, and he grabs it, and he goes up, and then he pulls it down. And then it stops on something, and that's what the person gets. That is literally what we do here in our society. We, we, every four years, we vote for someone to come in. And everyone puts their hope in that person that they're going to fix everything. And if my guy or if my girl wins, we're going to get it. And everyone comes with all these big hopes. And if there's anything we've learned through years and years of seeing this is that not everyone's going to get what they want. And there is no human being that's going to solve and fix all of our problems where we should put all of our hope in. It is, the, it is like, well, well, if this person does this, yeah, there is coming a king who will fix and make everything right. But until then, even if your person wins in four years, that dude or that lady, whoever they are, may be gone, and the next person comes in with different views. It is a democracy. But there is coming a king. Don't get caught up in this mess. Not, not God's people, right? We are looking towards glory. We, we are pushing. We are fighting in the midst of this tension with all these things. Don't get caught up and pulled off into the wrong place. We are playing Oh, this is who we have? All right, this is how I should respond as a believer in this season. This is how I should respond as a believer in this season. Until Jesus comes. We are his hands, we are his feet, we are his people. Father, thank you for this reminder that I, myself, do not always surrender. I want to fight I want to push, I want to quote, I want to, I want to have, I want to say the subliminal things to make sure that person is corrected and fixed and they know how I feel. But Lord, that is just evidence that I put too much hope into things that are fleeting. Father, I, I don't want to be type of person that tries to fix things by being shady with my language, aggressive here. Lord, I want to win people the way you want me to win people, by showing love, by being love, by absorbing the wacky, crazy weirdo that annoys me, by absorbing their stuff. Now, Lord, I, I hope no one under, takes that as receiving abuse or being mistreated in a way that is harmful. But where you can lay down your preferences and not try to win every conversation and every battle and defeat the enemy. Let us be reminded of Paul who who was on this crusade and actually realized he became the bad person in the story. Lord, sometimes we become the bad guy or the bad girl. Jesus, I want you to be the Lord over everything in my life. So can you help me? Lord, can you send people that can tell me the truth and not be fearful of my attitude? Can you send people in my life that love me so much that they will tell me the outright, absolute truth? And Lord, where others need it, can you help me be that for them? That we may grow into a more mature church 
that we may be an example to our brothers and our sisters and to other churches who are struggling and, and are going to struggle in this next season. Lord, can you help us be, be the uh, shoulders that they can lean on and see this is how you strive together with people who are different from you but are surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus. Lord, I love you. If there's anyone in here today, Lord, that your word is penetrating their heart, can you strengthen them and remind them that you love them and you are with them? And for anyone, Lord, that may have come in here not knowing you as their Lord and Savior, Father, I hope your spirit is ministering to them and is building them and is drawing them to your son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.